What are you going to do before you get to your car tonight? That's what winning is. Folks, we're very fortunate here in the state of Minnesota to have some legislators who have followed in the footsteps of Ron Paul. Ron Paul is a great man, he's a patriot, he's a pioneer, but he can't do this by himself. He needs you, and he needs folks who are willing to step up and run for and hold public office at each level of government who are going to hold fast to those same fundamental values that we all believe in. There are three folks who are here tonight in support of Ron Paul, to endorse Ron Paul, who are state representatives of Minnesota. It's my pleasure to introduce Representative Jim Abler, Representative Brandon Peterson, and Representative Kurt Bills. Now, just a, just a quick a quick programming note. It, it turns out that Representative Brandon Peterson was in an auto accident on the way here. He's fine, uh, but he's being held up just a little bit, as you might imagine. So we're not sure whether or not he's going to get here in time to speak, but we just want to make sure that you know that he supports Dr. Paul. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Representative Jim Abler. Oh, how great is this? Yeah, I actually can see it better down there. Um, this is my son, Judson. And uh, he's 13 years old. And he and you have something in common. You are all the future of America. All you out here, all you trying to make a difference. I'm a state representative. I'm a Minnesotan, but I'm also an American. And I care a lot about what happens. And I'm supporting Ron Paul for president. I got into politics when I was 17 and 18, and then Watergate happened when I was 19. I was very disappointed. You could imagine. And so I didn't do anything for a while. Um, and I met Ron Paul behind stage. I'd never met him before. What a man. What an inspiration. He's inspired you. He inspires me. Yeah, cheer for Ron Paul. He's worth it. It's a phenomenon. Why, why Ron Paul? Well, actually, he knows something. He's got some good advice. He actually has experience. He's actually had a real job, actually, life and death. America's at a place of life and death. Don't you think? He's a man, actually. He's honest. Whoa, how about that? Woohoo! And he's visionary. He actually has an idea where he might go when he becomes president. And a lot of people are frightened about that because they know what he wants to do. He actually wants to make America work, not just to work with welfare and, and handouts and, and caring for people who need extra help, but for the people who actually want to make America what it was when it was designed. Freedom, right? Somehow he thinks that somebody has to pay back $15 trillion. Oh, that's right. It's you and my son. And you may not like that idea so much, so he has a plan to help that happen. Anyway, they talked about the polls and all that. What matters is really the straw poll tomorrow. And, you know, in the American Revolution, um, there were three groups of people. There were 10% of the revolutionaries, 80% of the people who just tried to hide, and 10% Tories. Now, Ron is actually running in the 30% range. Now, that's quite a little bit better. And so what do those 10% do? What happened that we celebrated on July 4th and all that? They won! Yeah, they won! So, wow, could have had a V8. You don't got to have 100% to win. You got to have some really dedicated, good people. And so, I have a, I'm going to take uh, Mary Ann's idea one step further. I could actually do this myself. I'm 57 years old. I could do what I'm going to tell you. You take a picture where you're standing. I took my picture already. Um, take a, that's right. Um, so take a picture, put it on your face, put it on your page, invite all your friends to go in the state. 
Call up the one, call up five, and get all your friends to go, and you'll be shocked what will happen because of that. So let me tell you, character does matter. It matters to me. It matters to my son, and I hope I can be a dad he's proud of. Uh, vision does matter. And you know what? You matter. Make it happen. Well, I had this uh, joy on Saturday as well as to be the, the last person before the man comes out here. So it's a tough spot to be in because, right, he's coming out the door at when I'm done. So I, you bet hurry up. There's just one thing. You've got to get a little bit louder. I don't think you're there yet. You know, uh, this past Saturday, I was blessed by the experience of meeting Congressman Paul for the first time at Bethel College. I was able to share with the people who attended how his principled and dedicated approach has affected my life. You see, for the past 15 years, I've been teaching high school economics at Rosemount, and I still teach, and I still teach first hour AP econ before I go to the Capitol. When people ask me, when people ask me, I like to tell them that I'm an educator or I'm, e I'm an econ teacher first. Then, then I go and serve the people. I think you should still have a job, be a public servant. And I want to uh, thank people like Mary Ann and, and, and Dr. Paul, his wife, my wife, for putting up with the the hours that you put in, and, and you guys pour time in, too, to help out, um, know that we, we really appreciate it, and, and we need it. We need more. But knowing what you know today about the economy, can you imagine what I've been through in the last decade and a half teaching 17- and 18-year-olds about economics? I actually, I actually wrote down, I, I've kept track of some of the best quotes or questions or statements from students. I'm going to have to pay for it, even though other generations spent it. This one just a couple of months ago from a student as we were looking at the European uh, debt crisis. So they're trying to fix the debt problem by borrowing against the bailout funds that are made up of printed money. That's a high school. That's a high schooler. I'm, I'm not kidding you. Here, here's the. Here's the mass student of the year two years ago. This is the mass student of the year two years ago after we learned about the national debt and, and b the bond market. Mr. Bills, this is mathematically impossible if interest rates go up. <laughs> and my favorite, and my favorite, it comes to me every trimester, so, but from a different student. He doesn't just keep failing. Um, <laughs> you, you mean they just can print it? So I'm, I'm honored and, and uh, happy to be here, uh, motivated by Congressman Paul and what he's done, having the same principled voting record and being such a great role model. You know, when we bring him out here tonight, I want you to, through your applause, screams, chants, to let him know that this is only the beginning. For the Ron Paul revolution, for the Ron Paul Revolution, 2012 is 212. So just a second. Let me be clear. 2012 is 212, and let me explain what I mean. At 211 degrees, water is really hot. At 212, it boils. It goes from something hot to something that can power a machine. It's a basic law of nature, and it can remind us that small things can make a difference, that simple principles can yield prosperity. While establishment candidates have looked for magic tricks disguised as economic theory to fix this nation, our candidate knows the answers are straightforward. However, however, we now need to be the action and extra effort this year to take the movement 
to 212 in 2012. We need to get it to a boiling point. We will, we will get people to caucus tomorrow night. We will vote and support Ron Paul. We will be there to elect delegates and promote them to promote our cause. I call for right now this message that, that Mary Ann was talking about to go viral in Minnesota. Educate yourself, organize, be polite, logical, respectful and reasoned, and get people to caucus. Why would you be here? Why would you be listening if you didn't have an objective? Commit to this cause and help us. You will be the reason why 2012 is 212 for this movement. This is the year we boil it, turn it to steam, and take this train of liberty all the way to the White House. Now, now being, a, being an econ teacher with high standards, I'm going to give you a little test, and if you score 100%, you know who's going to come through that door. So feel free to respond, screaming yes, no, or making any loud noise. Do you want a smaller government? Yeah. Do you want the printing of money to end? Yeah. Do you want an end to the bailouts? Yeah. Can you handle personal liberty? 100% ladies and gentlemen, Texas Congressman and the next President of the United States of America, Ron Paul! Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Sounds to me like the cause of liberty is alive and well in Minnesota. Yay! You know, they have a lot of bright lights here. I can't see you real well, but I do hear you. That's great. <laughs> and somewhere down front, one side or the other, my wife Carol is with me, wife of 30, 55 years, right here. And uh, we have one of our 18 grandchildren with us. Uh, Linda is with us tonight. But, but I want to uh, thank especially everybody that participated in the introductions, the three state reps, uh, Kurt and Jim and Brandon. Thank you very much for those uh, uh, support. And, and also, Mary Ann certainly deserves our applause for all her hard work. And Walter and the Tea Party movement deserves an applause as well. Thank you. <laughs> but most of all, you all deserve the applause because you're very interested in doing something very important. And that is change this country, go back to our roots, decide that we want to live in a free country and not in a country rapidly drifting toward totalitarianism. We need to reverse the course. You know, the supporters, as well as myself, have been criticized. Have you ever noticed that every once in a while on TV, they like to criticize it? But, but the one that I get the biggest chuckle out is they call us dangerous. <laughs> of course we're dangerous. We're dangerous to the status quo and the people who have been ripping us off and living off everybody else.
We're, we're dangerous to those who have uh, the use of the uh, monetary system first, the people who influence the Federal Reserve, the people in the military-industrial complex, the people who get all the contracts. They don't want to disrupt it, and when they have a crisis, they come begging and pleading to get bailed out. When the good times are flowing, they expect to reap all the profits. That is going to change. You can't be consistent. If we had to summarize it into one word on what we must do and, and what is the important issue, to me, the important issue is liberty. If, if we look at all our political action, the political action should be to protect liberty. And we did a pretty good job on this for a while. But I would say in the last hundred years, things have been slipping. Now, I like to go after the president. I don't do it as much as some others because I see this as a big problem that's been lasting a long time. But if you're looking for things to criticize, it wouldn't be very hard to criticize the president. He wants to give you total socialized Obamacare, which we don't need and is way too expensive. But, but also, the promises made by both parties over the years, whether it was the promises of a humble foreign policy in the year 2000 or the promises made by the current president, Unfortunately, we continue to do the same thing, regardless of the election. They keep the same foreign policy, the same monetary policy, the same entitlement system, the same deficits. We need to clean house and say we want a renewal of the spirit of what's made this country great, and that means emphasizing your personal liberties. To defend liberty, we have to know where liberty comes from. The liberty doesn't come from our government. Sometimes they think they're passing it out, and sometimes they are always restricting as if it's their liberty rather than our liberty. But liberty is, comes to us as the Declaration of Independence states. Uh, our life and our liberty comes from our Creator or in a very natural way. So it's to each and every one of us that we should own that liberty and own our lives, and we should not only have our life and our liberty, but we ought to be able to keep the fruits of our labor. That's what we need, too. Now, one, one reason why the income tax is so detrimental, it's based on the assumption that the government owns everything, and they allow us to keep a certain percentage under their conditions. So it's a sellout in the sense of, of liberty. So that's been around, of course, officially since 1913. So when true liberty comes to this country, once again, government will be much smaller. We will not be the policemen of the world. We will not have the run runaway entitlements. And not only won't we have an income tax, we won't have a Federal Reserve system either. ever dreamed 10 years ago that we would have the attention of the Federal Reserve like we have today. <laughs> but but it, is, it is important. Once you come to understand what the monetary system is all about and why inflation is bad and why a, a few people in secret can create money out of thin air, I mean, we re you've come to realize how, how important it is in relationship to the warfare welfare state. None of this would happen if you didn't have the, in the Federal Reserve to monetize and buy the debt. How would this happen if members of Congress and others wanted to spend all this money and, and they didn't have to, <coughs> they, they should pay for it through taxation if they're going to do it. But that's difficult. It's good to pass out good things and largesse. It's not people finally get tired of the taxes. So they went and resorted to borrowing money too much. But then that pushed interest rates up, so they invented this thing of the Federal Reserve, because that you can hide the inflation, you can transfer the penalty from one group to another. But ultimately, uh, the, uh, th this all catches up with us. But 
in the meantime, what it does, if we don't have to pay the bills up front, it allows governments to grow. And this is what has happened. In collaboration with the Federal Reserve and the politicians who got reelected by doing exactly what the people were asking for, well, just send us more stuff. But they did that for a while until we finally consumed all the wealth of the country. Real productivity has gone overseas. So the only thing left now is borrowing, but that pushes interest rates up. It would stop if they couldn't monetize the debt. Interest rates would go too high and the Congress would have to cut spending. But now they go to the, the Federal Reserve and they, they print the money. As long as that happens, government will grow. It will end because many a country has tried this in the past. It ends up badly. It ends up with the destruction of the currency. The one characteristic of the destruction of currency, depreciation of currency, is that the middle class shrinks and the wealthy class gets wealthier. And just look at it, not, not just in the last few years, but over the decades. That's generally has been the case. A lot of wealth has, le has left the middle class. When we had a freer market and sounder money and limited government, the middle class in this country was the largest middle class in the history of the world, and it was the wealthiest middle class in the world. I think we lost the moral high ground many years ago, probably a little bit before the Depression or from the progressive era. We lost the moral high ground because those who said that government will always take care of those people who are having problems. And if you're a humanitarian, you want to give free stuff out. You want to give free food, free medical care, free education, free houses, and everything will be okay. The trouble is, you can do that for a little while, but then it ends, and then the people are unhappy, and guess what? The very people who were supposed to be helped with these humanitarians who were, go who were intent to in transfer the wealth around the world and, and think that wealth can come from spending and printing press money, when that it comes out, guess who suffers the most? The very people they were pretending to help, and that is what is so clear today, and this is what's happened in the last four years. The evidence is out on the table. The monetary system doesn't work. The foreign policy doesn't work, leads to endless wars. The economic system is deeply in debt now. And that is the reason that we have to restore the basic values of just common sense, sound money, private property. And also, we have to address this, this, this foreign policy that has given us endless wars against enemies that we don't know who the enemies are. We don't know why we go to war. We don't declare the wars. We don't know when the wars are over because they're endless. We need the policy change. We need to end the wars and we need to bring our troops home. The message, the message of liberty has been around a long time. We talked a little bit about it four years ago, and a lot of people joined the effort in the last four years a lot more. But e even, even today, this message of liberty is spreading. We get criticized also for the foreign policy of minding our own business and providing for a stronger national defense because they don't understand. But guess who should understand the most? Those who are serving and who have served in the military, and guess the who they support for the presidency of the United States. Now, most people know that I've served in the military. I was in the military for five years. There's no, there's no other candidate that uh, has, has been in the military. Some people say, oh, they just support you because you're in the military. That's partial, but I don't think that's the whole thing. I think it's the foreign policy and the concern and the commitment that I would never send troops into a war that is not declared, know exactly who the enemy is, fight it, win it, and get it over with and come home. In office, and as well as going in the military, we take an oath of office to defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic. 
I can reassure you that the foreign enemies are not a threat to us. There's nobody on the verge of invading us, believe me. We have more weaponry and we spend more on our military than everybody else put together. So this whole idea that on, we're on the verge of being attacked, this was true when I was in the military in the 60s. The Soviets were a power. Of course, they bankrupted themselves, uh, and, and, and they, their, their empire ended. But we, we have to realize that uh, we don't have this fear. We don't have to keep spending more and more and more. Matter of fact, the more we spend, the more we send our troops overseas, the more bases we have, the more drone missiles we use to kill people, the less safe we are. We're not safer by running that foreign policy. Not only do I believe it's a detriment to our national security, I believe it is a major part of the devastating budget deficit we have. We've spent $4 trillion that was put into our debt in the last 10 years with our overseas commitment. So this bringing troops home, you don't have to put them out of the military. The immediate effect of bringing troops home rapidly would be that all of a sudden, all those military personnel would be spending their money in this country, not in Germany and Japan and South Korea. Under conditions of war, whether it's a war overseas or a war against the American people in a war that they call the war on drugs, uh, I think we should stop all those wars. <laughs> It's actually, it's actually a war on our, on our civil liberties, and uh, we, we have seen this systematically, especially since 9-11. 9-11 was a serious, serious matter. I voted to what, whatever we can to go after those individuals responsible. I was discouraged rather rapidly after 9-11 because they used it as an excuse to do something they had been planning on doing for six years. And my first speech against the Iraqi war was in 1998 because it was clearly evident to me that they were going to do that. But after 9-11 occurred, they didn't seem to, it seemed like it took about 10 years to get one guy with all the weapons and all the technology we have. It takes 10 years to find him. But what did we do? We went into, into Iraq, we went into nation building and invaded these various countries. You know, if you add up the, the contractors, we, we've lost close to 9,000 Americans in this period of time, 44,000 severe injuries. We have hundreds of thousands of veterans today begging and pleading for help. We have an epidemic of suicide of people who have come home from, uh, from Iraq and Iran. So th it is very, very high cost, and obviously it would be much better if we had not gotten involved. But in the other area, at home, the real enemy right now, in, in my estimation, because I do believe we have a powerful, efficient military, so I don't believe we have to worry about it, but I do believe in the second half of our oath of office that we have to defend against all enemies, foreign and domestic. So once again, shortly after 9-11, within a week or two, there was a bill brought to the floor that had been floating around the Congress for several years, but it never had enough support and they couldn't get it passed. But on after 9-11, they said, now is the time that we'll pass this wonderful bill that's going to protect the people, the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act is very, very unpatriotic, if you want to know. <laughs> So that bill was passed rather rapidly. It is the gives it, if uh, they, one member of Congress told me he had to vote for it. He says, I didn't have time to read it, but it was called the Patriot Act. And uh, how could I go home and explain it if I voted for it? I tried to explain to him that was his job. He was supposed to go home and explain why he voted the right way. So, but it, in the bills, you may have noticed this already, but 
in Washington, they name a bill, and the bill, the name always sounds pretty good. It's just assume, maybe not 100%, but just assume that the name of the bill will be opposite of what they're trying to do. But if they had called that repeal the Fourth Amendment Act, maybe it wouldn't have passed so easily. <laughs> But the undermining our, of our Fourth Amendment rights, especially at airports, all is a consequence of the Patriot Act. As far as I'm concerned, pro private property and, and individuals should be protected, but they should be protected by the property owners and not by the TSA. <laughs> But I think if we allow it to stand and look at the pictures we've seen on televisions and newspaper of the poking and the prodding of little children to elderly women in wheelchairs and, and making us think that we're safer because of this, it, it is impossible. I think it's to, it's, I think it's there to intimidate us and make us compliant and listen to the government. This is what happens when you move from freedom to a tyrannical state. They want you to obey the government instead of obeying your own hearts and your own mind, your own property. But the, uh, the, the Patriot Act certainly was a big problem for us, but it's still ongoing. May, you may have heard that uh, the National Defense Authorization Act was passed. And I'm very impressed that you know what I'm talking about. Because you, because I'm, I'm convinced you didn't hear it on evening news, so you must be getting your news someplace else. But this is a very, very piece of legislation. It passed in the, in the Senate and the House. The President gave us a happy New Year by signing it on New Year's Day. But the, the real wicked part of this, it changed our history in many ways because uh, civil, civil laws should always be enforced by civil, uh, civil, uh, civil police and, and local police. But now it is, it is institutionalized, it is uh, codified, it says the military now can arrest any American citizen put under arrest, no lawyer, no charges, no trial, can be put in prison indefinitely. Now this, this needs, this needs to be changed. We will not be living in a free society in the Republic because, the, because it will be used. They don't write these laws not to use them. One year ago, one year ago, the president announced, he had uh, somebody come to the Senate and he came and announced, he says, well, it is now the policy of the United States that we can assassinate American citizens. I mean, where, where does he get this power? Where does he get this power? Where does he think he gets the power? But we cannot, we cannot let this stand. But to prove his point from his side, he's already used it. He's used it three times. He picked a, he picked a guy that he decided was a bad guy. He may well have been a bad guy. His name is al He doesn't live here. He's an American citizen. He was in Yemen. But he wasn't charged. He wasn't tried. He wasn't arrested. But he, he was assassinated because he was associating with bad people. But he was never convicted or even accused of a crime. So they get him. They, they kill him and nobody's going to worry too much. But the next week they decided that he had a relative that was an ally of his. So they said, we need to kill him too. So they went over and they dropped another, uh, another drone missile on him and they killed his son. It turns out though, his son was 16. He was barbecuing out in the, out in the backyard. This is not what America is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be about the rule of law and we all are supposed to be protected. Our economy, our economy is not going to be revived until we come to our senses. We, we got into a mess because we spent too much, we had too much debt, we borrowed too much, then we printed too much, we regulated too much, and uh, then we, then we resort, you know, depended on the Federal Reserve. But 
when the crisis hit and became obvious, and of course it was predicted by many that it would come, the bubble finally burst, and guess what the solution has been? Spend more, tax more, print more, and continue to do the same thing. And then they wonder why they're not getting good results. We have to decide whether or what we want to have a free market economy with sound money, a gold-backed currency, restrain the Federal Reserve, and restrain the Congress from spending money. Now, I want to, you know, cut the budget by a trillion dollars and uh, first year. <laughs> now, people get nervous. I say, oh, if the government doesn't spend a trillion dollars. Won't that weaken the economy? No, it's going to help the economy because to spend it, they either have to inflate, which hurts us all, or they have to take it from the economy and spend it. And I've met a couple politicians and I've met a few bureaucrats. They don't have any idea how best to spend your money. Only you know how to spend your money. But we, we have to ask a couple of basic questions. The first basic question is what should the role of government be? Should the role of government be there to run the entitlement system? Should we believe this, this story that entitlements are rights? People now like to have the shock effect because they know what my answer is going to be. Do people have a right to medical care? Do they have a right to a food, a right to a house? And I said, no, they don't. They have a right to their life. They have a right to their liberty. If they had a right to keep their property, then they would be able to afford it. When government does it, they end up not getting anything. But the, the entitlement system has to be challenged, the foreign policy has to be challenged, the monetary policy has to be challenged, and quite frankly, the others aren't doing that. They're, it's all the status quo, whether both parties, they, yes, they sound different, but the goal of most people that I've ever met has been more power. The arguments are real between conservatives and liberals and Republicans and Democrats, but it's all over power. It isn't over whether what kind of government we want. The founders knew this. They had a revolution and wrote a, wrote a constitution, and they wanted the government to be very restrained. I believe that most of the reason why we're in this mess now has been because we have failed to follow the Constitution. And I believe we could get out of this mess if we sent only individuals to Washington that would take their oath of office seriously and obey the Constitution. Samuel, Samuel Adams was very clear, and other founders uh, worried about uh, whether or not we would keep our republic. And they warned us if we weren't careful, the republic would go into uh, a dictatorship of the majority, which is called pure democracy. And that means that 51 percent, if they go along with it, they can take away the rights of the minority. And if you look at the Patriot Act and the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, that's exactly what's happening. And if the majority endorses that, then the minority is, uh, is, is undermined. But uh, uh, Samuel Adams said that it, when you get worried about not having enough, that today we don't have 51 percent of the people right now that endorse everything that we say. But the truth is, you don't have to. But you have to have leadership. You have to have people in the right places. 51% of the people of this state will not be voting tomorrow. You will be voting. And you have more clout than those who don't vote. And he advised that uh, it, it never requires a majority. It, it requires a minority that is fed up with it. They'd be irate and tireless and determined and believe in something. And their goal should be to continue to uh, light brush flowers of liberty in the hearts and minds of men. And I think that's what's happening in this country. These last four years especially, so different than it was when I first started in the 70s. All of a sudden, the young people are waking up and those who dreamed about this and thought it was all dead are coming alive again.
And it's been said that you should never doubt that a small group of people who have firm convictions can change the world. You never doubt it because that's the only way it's ever happened before. Both, both in the negative and the positive, I'm sure when the uh, communists took over the Soviets, they didn't have a vote and the large majority said, oh, we all want communism. No, it's a determined p group. The most important thing is that the determined minority has to have the right viewpoints. And my argument is, if you care about people, you care about yourself, you care about your family, you care, you have to opt for liberty. Because it is liberty that offers us not only this wonderful opportunity, but also it offers us wealth. I have always been convinced that I love my freedom. And I've, I've had that desire that I'm sure all of us have had. I love my freedom. I would be willing to give up wealth if I could have my freedom. But the, but the wonderful thing about it is we don't have to make a choice. The history, history shows that the freer a society, the wealthier the society. The larger the middle class and the better the distribution. So we don't have to argue that case. The bigger the government, even when it's designed, the, the government and the, and, the, uh, uh, and the welfare system is designed to help the poor, and actually the biggest beneficiaries are the rich. They get, they get the money and they get the bailouts and, and they get the benefits of the inflationary system. So we should not lose this argument. For a while when we were consuming wealth, it was more difficult because everybody was sort of getting stuff. And, but most people now know that there's something seriously wrong with Social Security. All these programs are bankrupt, and we don't cut anything. We still think we have another war to win. Today, they're talking about what we're going to... We're upset because the world hasn't joined us in going to war in Syria. And uh, soon it'll be, be Iran that we have to go into war for. So... But... but now, I think the people are realizing this isn't going to last. Even those in leadership that are saying that we have to continue this. Nobody's arguing the case. But the other thing that happens, both negative and positively, the end of stages of a, of a currency goes down rapidly and you can have, have chaos, and uh, political and economic. But in the, end, in the other sense, the ballooning up and the joining of a movement sometimes moves rather rapidly. I think we're on the verge of that. I think we've already seen the opening. It isn't just a few people. It isn't just a few people in think tanks now. This is all around. It's getting into our university. It's getting into the media. And thank goodness for the Internet. <laughs> That is why, and the, talking about the Internet is a good example of a success that so many of you participated in. The uh, Stop Online Piracy Act was stopped because of you. So when the people speak out, the politicians listen. They're all, they don't have that much conviction. You are in charge if you speak out and get the message. And that's what this campaign is all about. But there's every reason to look at this optimistically because more people are discovering what's happening. The young people are coming alive and those who have been waiting for this are willing to join. I had an interviewer the other day and I complimented on him, which is rather rare. <laughs> he said that, uh, you're, you know, the young people come out to your functions and there's a lot and they get real excited. But he said in the last six months, he says, I've noticed that there are more than just the young people coming out. And I said, yes, that's because we're all thinking very young these days. And since liberty is a young idea, it was only tested for a short period of time, tyranny is the old idea. It's over and done with. We don't need more tyranny. We need to improve upon what we know about liberty. It's Thank you very much. <laughs>